I mean, gigantic. Uh, I just don't know where to begin, except right there in the text. <laughs> Let's start. Kai. Kai. Ano menen. Ano menen. Om. Alto. Alto. Ek. Ek. Kol. Kol. Urano. Urano. Kol. Kol. Egere. Egere. Ek. Ek. And then tone is a practical substance. We're going to put it in there, but it's not really in the text. Okay, so on. On. Necro. Necro. Asun. Asun. Tone. Tone. Rumenon. Rumenon. Himas. Himas. Hek. Hek, that is. Pace. Pace. Orgais. Orgais. Pace. Pace. Erko menes. Erko menes. And this, we just, we just began. You have the text here, probably. But do you see all those notes on the side? All those notes? <laughs> and that, those are only to jog my memory. <laughs> it's, there's so much in this verse. Uh, Titus 2.13 talks about this. 1 Thessalonians 2.16, Romans 3 and 5, 5 and 9, 9 22, 13 and 5, Isaiah 59 and 20, Romans 11.26. And uh, Rome. Uh, Revelation 6, 16, and 17, 11, and 18, 16, 19, 19, and 15. Uh, Luke, see, Matthew 6, 13, and 27, 43, Luke 1, 74, Romans 15, 31, Acts 2, 34, 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, Romans 5, and 9, 2 Timothy 4, 17, and Matthew 3, and 7. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 and 5 and 9 to get started. <laughs> wow. This this little have you ever I know you know Dakota got me a couple of presents lately and, and she had them on the table in there and she had my name written in bold letters on this thing and and I picked it up, and I shook it, and I listened to it, and I looked like this. There was a little hole in it where I could see in there, see what it was. I, I was, you know, I just wanted her to make her know that I really appreciated this. Like I really wanted this real bad. But I remember when I was a little bitty kid. If I had something on the Christmas tree, I would go in there and I'd kick it a little bit or something. <laughs> and make it. Here, here, here. Just, just a little bit, you know, I fall on it or something. Just fall on it, whatever, you know. So the corner, so I could look in there and see what was in it. It's just like this verse is like people into a tremendous spectrum. It's like, it's just like this hole right here like this. But on the other side of that hole is a dimension that you cannot see the beginning and the end of, or the top and the bottom. And so this is real hard to teach from this verse in one in one class. Even though, you know, we, we I teach Greek and I try to get the Greek to you. But we also study theology. Now let's go back and begin to look through this people. Right now, it's just, right now, all you see is it. Okay? When we get through with this verse, I hope you begin to see dimly, at least, the things that are beyond the spectrum that goes all the way around. And it's just a complete, tremendous spectrum that starts right there. Okay? Kai is an. And then we have uh, to remain up. That's what it literally means. It comes from awe and mental. And it means to remain up or to not go to sleep, to stay awake, uh, to be in a state of readiness. It's like a guard that is 
you're surrounded by enemies. And there's guards in a, in a circle around the camp. And the guards in this circle around the camp all, and they're at any time they're they're ready to attack. They're there. They're ready to sneak in, ready to infiltrate. It's like being out in the ocean and sitting in a little boat and having sharks coming at you in every direction. Okay, you have to be ready. Well, that word, this is what this word means. It means it's it's uh, to be in a state is present and active, active, and it means to, to remain in a state of alertness. And Brother Greg, we're in First Thessalonians 1 and 10. We're in a giant verse. Giant verse. It's not very long, but it's gigantic in content. Uh, Titus 2.13, I believe is a... Can you read that for me, Brother? Titus 2.13? Titus 2.13. Yeah. We're in 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. You remember Philemon, and that was your first sermon, oh, remember? Just before that one he preached on. That's right. Why are you wearing hats? That's how he... We need Bill in here. <laughs> Where's Bill when you need him? I decided to leave in Hebrews James. Okay, I'm on the wrong side of Hebrews. Ah, oh. I, I use Hebrews as my mark. If oh, I'm on the wrong side of the mark, I'm in oh, trouble. I'm on the wrong side. Oh, okay. All right, Titus, uh-huh. Titus 2.13. All righty. There's a lot in this verse. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for, looking for. Looking up, remaining awake, to look up, to remain up. When Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and this is a beautiful story because it was done twice by Jesus. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Did you know that? Twice he left this earth from the Mount of Olives. Did you know that? Two times he left this earth. In the Old Testament, when God Shekinah glory was leaving the temple, first of all, and who was it? the presence of God is Jesus, okay? He went out of the door and sat on the doorstep of the temple and it remained the Shekinah glory of God remained there. Then it went out to the gateway to the temple. And then it went out to the gateway to the city. And then it went and waited there for a while. And then it went up to the Mount of Olives and waited and looked. And, and as if the Shekinah glory of God was looking back to Jerusalem. Remember what Jesus said when he looked back to Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. How many times I would cluck for you if, if, if you had just come, but you wouldn't come. Like the mother hand does for a baby, but you would not come. He went there, and then the Shekinah glory of God departed and ascended into heaven. There's a Hebrew word in the Old Testament, and the, the New Testament correct equivalent is Anabino. The offerings that they offered in the Old Testament the ones that were completely burned up, the whole burnt offerings. It's so beautiful. We're going to teach this on Sunday morning, too. We're going to go into the types of the Old Testament. You want to come home with us? On a Bible, it meant to ascend. The offering, the ascending offering. The offering that burned up and vaporized and went to heaven. The ascending offering. And those offerings, guess who they represented? Christ. And then when Jesus had uh, completely equipped his church with all of his presence that they could that they needed, he told them, He said, You remain in Jerusalem until I until you receive power from on high. And then you'll be scattered out of the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you always. He said, well, there are two or three gathered together in my authority, my name or my authority, I will be with you. He promised them that. But when he left, where did he leave from? Again, the Mount of Olives. 
And then the two angels that were bearing witness to this. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So there were two witnesses. How many witnesses were there when Jesus ascended the second time? Well, there was 120 of them in the church that was there on the day of Pentecost. Now, and evidently, they, well, they were following Jesus around at that time. We had 120 witnesses. See, that's a multiple of two, isn't it? And there were two angelic beings there also witnessing. And said, man, why do you stand here gazing up? He'll come back just like he went. So we're waiting for him to come back. We're supposed to be in a state of readiness looking up for him to come back. To remain up. Ana mene. Ana mene. Ana and meno. That's what it comes from. Ana and meno. To remain awake. To remain in a constant state of readiness. And then it says, Tol huion altu. Here we have, do you see this object here? The accusative case, and then we have belonging to him. See that, Timothy? That's what you were talking about a while ago when you asked the question before. The son of him. The, not only the son, tone we own. And it means the son. The son. The God. God, the son. Okay? The son. Tone we own. And what does that word we owe mean? That's where it comes from. That's the nominally singular writing of it. The root of it. We owe It means the air. It means the, the blood heir, the heir by blood. When Jesus said, my father sent me, you know what he was saying? Huh? He said, I am God the Son. Every time he said, my father, my father sent me this, or my father sent me this. And the Old Testament, the, the disciples in the Old Testament and I mean disciples, I mean the national Israel or Abraham or whatever. They didn't look upon God as Father. They weren't allowed to talk to him or speak to him as Father. But he was the great God of heaven, the unapproachable one. But now Jesus says, my Father, my Daddy, my Daddy. And what did he mean by that? That I am his blood heir. I am God the Son. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, 1, John 1.18. 1, he is the very presence, the Shekinah glory, the person of God in flesh. So that's what the word we all means there. And then how to, that's in the what case? Third person pronoun. Genitive. Oh, that's in the genitive case. Belonging to him. And then it says... <clears throat> Where did he come from, by the way? Ecton Urano. Out of heaven. Out of the heavens. Heavens. He not only was in the presence of God, but all over the heavens. All the heavens. He came down out of the heavens. All right, this son, this heir of him. God the Son came to earth and became flesh to redeem us. Okay? Another offering in the Old Testament. And I'm just giving you a little look-see because some of you aren't in the, in the doctrines of the Bible class. I'm going to teach one of those types, a lesson on types. But another one of the, the offerings in the Old Testament, of course, Jesus was a type of all of the Old Testament offerings, wasn't he? He was a, a type of all of the Old Testament offerings. One of the offerings, they would bring it, and they would kill it. Its blood would be shed. It took its blood and put on the the altar. And what did they do with this flesh? They took the fat and they put it on the altar and they burned it up. And where did the fat go? It was the on a vino, it was the descending offering, of course. It went to work. The fat went to work. It went to heaven. Alright? And then the priest took part of it and they ate it. And then they took some of it and sent it back home for them to eat. So guess what? Here we have God partaking of this offering. We have the priests partaking of this offering. And we have the assembly or persons of Israel partaking of this. This is what you call a communion. Isn't that beautiful? You heard that one before, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's Hebrew. That's there's some beautiful things in Hebrew that you don't get it. Hebrew is an action language. 
the New Testament, that language is a doctrinal language. That's a, le a language of absolute perfection, doctrinally and grammatically, grammatical perfection. And then it says who, and here we have again, this is an accusative singular masculine relative pronoun, isn't it? Sure. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> See that O there? Now look back up there to wheel. Look at the last two letters in wheel. It's Omicron Nu, isn't it? O-N. Now what do you have down here in this relative pronoun? Relative pronoun takes the place of a... That takes the place of a noun. Instead of writing we on down there again, you write down who, whom. All right? Whom. It just shortens it. That's what it does. It's a, a, a pronoun is a short form of the noun sometimes. All right? So we have the sun, the air, and what happened to the air on this earth? What did the earth do to the air of God? Jesus said, he told a story to the Jews. He said there was a rich landowner, and this rich landowner, this is a parable. This rich, rich landowner, who did that rich landowner represent? God. Okay? And this rich landowner sent down his servants to the people that were sharecroppers. Sharecroppers. And they said, give me back my tithe, my rent. Okay? He said, give me my rent on my land. And what did they do to these messengers from the king? All right. Who did those messengers from the king represent? It's the prophets of the Old Testament prophets. All right. You getting this young man? This is good stuff. All right. And then he said, I will send my only son, my only heir, Quio. I will send my only heir, and surely they will hear him and they will obey him and be persuaded by him. That's what it says. Persuaded by him. And what did they do to him? Who was this heir? This was God himself in the person of the Son. Okay? Came down to this earth. God came down to this earth in the physical representation of his Son. And what did they do to him? Kill him. They killed him. They murdered him. Falsely accused him. And they said, let's take his inheritance. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. That was national Israel. All right. The heir whom he raised out of Tone Necron. He raised up a god ray. Comes from a god ray. Third person singular, first heiress indicative active. First heiress, what, how many times did Jesus get raised from the dead? Once. Once. That's it. One time. He raised up out of that ek there. You can look that up on page 121. That's ek. That's the same, same word that you see on your ek signs, your exit sign. Okay? Out of. When you see ek there, what do you automatically think of, Brother Ken? Out or from. Okay, but that is the case of what? Oh, oh, I, Nominative, I genitive, ablative. All right. Oblative. See, there's eight cases of Greek. Nominative, genitive, ablative, locative, instrumental, native, accusative, and vocative. Eight cases, okay? And this one is not the genitive case, not the case of possession, but the case of whence, from where it came. All right. Out of, ablative, from where? Okay. Out of the heavens. Right? And he came out of the heavens, and then what else? He came when he was killed, when actually he gave his life, he came out from the dead ones, the necros. It's necron here. What does that word necros mean? What? Dead. Dead. What's the English equivalent to that? Necros. We use that in many medical terms. All right, dead people. Dead people. Jesus' body was dead. His spirit departed from that body. They took that body and they put it in grave. 
Jesus did not go out of existence, nor do you go out of existence when you die. You don't go to sleep. Don't go on hold. You go to be with God, or you go to hell on the other. Whom he raised out of the dead ones. And then it says, a soon. Tone, a soon. Who's, what's this a soon here? It comes from Asus. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. All right. And what does Jesus mean? Do you remember what Jesus means? That's very beautiful. It's very important. Jesus. What does that name mean? It means it, he is Savior, but uh, that, that's Messiah. He who comes to save. Well, well, he is the rescuer. But what does what does Jesus mean? Jesus. It means also Joshua in the Old Testament. Jehovah, Jehovah what? Saves. saves. That's what it means. Jehovah saves. All right, Jehovah saves. That's what Jesus means. Jehovah saves, and then it says, Ton Heru Mino. The name Hiram comes out of here. Hiram comes out of this word. Now that that's that's a word that means to snatch out. All right, to snatch away. It. it how many of you ever heard of a, a raptor? What do you call those things in Jurassic Park thing? Oh, they're velociraptors. All right. All right. Basketball players. <laughs> <laughs> they they snatch things. Well, raptor means a bird of prey. By the way, a vulture is not a raptor. Did you know that? Why is a vulture not a raptor? Why is it not a raptor? It eats something somebody else killed. It eats something somebody else killed, but why is it not a raptor? It's not a predator. Does it pick up things off the ground? It what? It just eats things on the ground rather than picking it up. Oh, it can't carry them off, does it? How many of you ever had a chicken? <laughs> chicken is not a raptor. On my plate. <laughs> no bones. Well, a chicken is not a raptor. A chicken is not a raptor. Now, a chicken will eat anything. Well, a raptor is not a. Well, I don't know. Is it a bird? A or raptor? Or yeah, or a raptor is, is, a is a bird. But there's a difference between a chicken and a vulture and a turkey and a quail and a pheasant and all of those things. That there's their feet. Their feet do not have talons on them. Like eagle has yeah, eagles and hawks and owls have talons. They are raptors, and they are able to snatch something and pull it up. I'll never forget when I was in Nevada. I was on the way to school. Margaret, can you see if you remember this? If you went to school that day. <laughs> 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 it's awful hard for her to cut classes in Fish Lake Valley because there wasn't very much, very many places to go. <laughs> but we were on the way to school, and we were down there just about the Nevada California line, and they used to have a lot of piles of dirt out there, and these great big golden eagles were there every day. And this golden eagle swooped down and grabbed a big rabbit and took off flying with it. Just fly, and I mean his wings are like eight, seven, eight, seven or eight feet wide. It takes a lot of force to get a rabbit up, a big heavy rabbit like that. And this rabbit was screaming its head off. Just just kept screaming like that. And this but this raptor had it was its talons were stuck and just like bison's with steel knives on the end of it. Raptor. It's a snatch away. But that's what this word means. It's accusative, singular, masculine. The one rapturing. The one snatching us up. The one delivering us. The one rescuing us. The Latin is rapare. And our English word rapture. Rapture. comes from this word, and the Latin is rapare, 
And uh, of course, the Greek word Ruo. Ruo Mano. Ruo Mano. To snatch up. To carry away. The word rapture is in the Bible. Your hyper Calvinist will tell you the word rapture is not in the Bible. Here is the word right here. The Latin equivalent of it is that rapare. And our English equivalent of rapare is rapture. Christ is going to come one of these days if, in this period of time that we live in today. Sometime within this period of time, Christ is going to come. And he is going to snatch away, out of harm's way, his people before the tribulation period starts upon this earth. That's the word right there. And of course... Paul is speaking here, and he says, he must accuse the plural. Accuse the plural, first personal pronoun. All right? Accuse the plural, first personal pronoun. In other words, it's us. He's going to rapture us. Us. What are we supposed to be doing? I know my name. Waiting, Waiting looking up all the time for him to do this. Expecting it. Praying for it. I was over at Dr. Susan's house Sunday, and I was talking to uh, Irene Montebron. And she's in our Sunday morning classes sometimes with Joel and her, and Joel has been pretty sick too. You need to pray for her. Mm -hmm. And she was, I uh, led them to the Lord many years ago, baptized them between 20 and 30 years ago, something. Mm -hmm. Long time ago. <laughs> Levine was the first one of that family. When she was first saved, she didn't want the rapture to come because she had a lot of bills. She said, I have to pay my bills off first. And I got I told her, I said, Irene, when you leave, everything's going to be here. You're not going to carry any threads <laughs> there with you. Nothing's going to go with you that will tie you to this earth. And you don't have to worry about paying in on these, these bills at all. She said, oh! <laughs> She's pretty right now. <laughs> now, why? They can have it all. They have my car, they have the house, they can have whatever. It doesn't matter, does it? When you're raptured, when, when the Lord takes you away, let them have it all. We're not going to take anything with us, are we? Or can we? What are you going to take with you? How many of you did something eternal this week? You're going to take that with you? Do something eternal? Prayer, witnessing, lost souls? You're going to take every lost soul that you ever talked to and witnessed to, and it was born again with you. That night you might have your brother back with this. That'll give you a, a, a zeal for lost souls. That's eternal stuff. Eternal things. Raptures us. Ek tes. Here we have this word ek again. This old exit word here. Ek tes. What taste? That's a the. That taste. That's a that's a definite article there. And in what kind of case is it in? Genesis. I mean, genitive singular. <coughs> Or days is what it's describing. Genitive singular or ablative singular feminine, that is. Ablative singular feminine. I said genitive, I said, I said ablative. Ablative singular feminine. Out of. Out of what is or days? Remember what that one is? Or days. Wrath. Wrath. I, and this this is swelling indignation is what this word means. Swelling indignation. 
the straw that broke the camel's back. You ever heard of that old term? The straw that broke the camel's back? That's what it's talking about. God is allowing everything to go. Every person in this world that is lost, today they have one more day if they live through today. There are a lot of lost people that live through today. You know that? They didn't make it today. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Somebody turn there for me, please. Hebrews 2. You know where that is, don't you, brother? <laughs> <laughs> children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Alright. When the Lord saved you, he saved you out of sin. Did you know that? You don't have to keep on sinning because you have the power of God not to do it. You don't have to go back and do the same thing that you did before. If you act like you did before you were saved, then you're probably still lost. Because saved people act like saved people because you have the power to overcome the evil world that you live in today. You have power to overcome it. This word deliverance, Hebrew, ga'al or ga'el, and sometimes adah, uh, It means to uh, we have redemptive deliverance. First of all, we're redeemed. There's a lot in this word, and it's translated into the New Testament here. And sometimes I lost the idea in English how you're delivered. You're delivered from uh, from damnation. Okay, you're delivered from the fires of hell. <coughs> You have physical deliverance. Physical deliverance. How does God physically deliver you? Pains in this world. Well, through yes, prayer, sometimes God raises you from a sick bed. Uh, physical deliverance. Many times, God. Oh, I was going to bring that. Th- I forgot this. I was bringing an illustration tonight. And I forgot about it. I've been so sick today that I have not been able to think at all today. And I forgot to bring my... This was my epitome of this lesson tonight. I'll tell you what it is. I have a gun at home that I shot. And when I shot it, it exploded. Like you cannot believe. The barrel split half in two. One half of the barrel went to a two by six or two by eight and just cut it right half in two. The other one blew part of the wall down, knocked the door down, and the gun just went to smithereens like that. And all I had left in it was a piece of the butt stock and the trigger guard. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and the part right behind me was the plug that had screwed down. This was a uh, like an 1820s gun. And I overloaded it and almost killed myself. God power delivered me. That's all I can say. It's the, it's, I was delivered by the power of God. That was my illustration. If you could see it, it would... I'll bring it to you unless you see it later. But here's the plug. It's about this big around, the plug in the back. And all that plug is part of the butt stock. This gun is like this. This is like the old dude with the pistol like this. Have a stock like this, a wooden stock, and then the barrels in here move out there like that, and it has a hammer that comes over here, and you put a cap on top of that, and you fill this thing with powder, and the trigger and trigger guard is down here, and it comes down here a little bit, and screws in there, and screws in right there. 
This thing in the back, this hammer was just totally distorted. It's just twisted like you can't believe. It's like it was an explosion. It was. The back of that thing, which should have gone through my body, completely blew itself out of the stock. And all it is is a piece of the stock, like that wood, with a screw in it. And here it is, a threaded screw like that. And it didn't go through me. Everything went someplace else. It just left one thing for, to remind me how powerful that explosion was. I got little pieces of it here and there. And tiny little pieces. But my finger was just mangled from there out. It was just pieces of flesh on both. A piece of that thing went by and got my finger. Boy, what a... What a snatching away. What a deliverance. I remember one time I was riding a, uh, a tremendously horrible horse. And the horse just picked me up and he kicked me and stomped me and cut my ear in half and gave me a basal fracture and tried to just tear my whole body apart. I was just blood all over. And my body had about that much cushion of blood on top of all of my flesh, just all over the place. My legs were just, I had to stick needles and drain the blood out of me. It was just... I was bleeding everywhere under the flesh. Well, God delivered me that time. I remember another time when God delivered me. I kept the angels busy. <laughs> I was stupid. <laughs> this time it wasn't really my fault. Some of the other times were. Sometimes you stick yourself, you, you go, you tread where angels fear to tread. We do that sometimes. But I'm going to tell you something. If you walk out of hell here tonight lost, you're a bigger fool than I was when I pulled that trigger. I was going down the road. I had gone to, to get something from my mother. I went to get her some walnuts over to a friend of mine's house, George Vickers, out in the Fairfax area, off a of Weed Patch Highway out there. And I was an old Jeep pickup that I had put up a Ford V8 engine, well, it's a 289 Ford V8 engine, and it was four-wheel drive and everything, and it was really pretty, and I was, I just got hurt in the oil fields, and I could just barely get around, and I was going to have to sell it, and to get money to keep on eating on. Well, my mother wanted some of these walnuts from out there, so I went out there and picked them up. I got them in, and I remember when I was out there, I, my back hurt so bad, it just almost passed out. And I just put these little walnut, sacks of walnuts in the seat, and I went and started home. And I wasn't going very fast, about 40 to 45 miles an hour. And then this other guy comes back about 75 to 90 miles an hour, they said, coming this way. Straight, we were going down Brundage Lane, or Brundage Highway. And this car, duck dog, runs out in front of me. Great big German Shepherd chasing a rabbit. And he he runs right out of the bushes right in front of me. I hit him like this, and my truck just goes sideways just like this because he's big, and it just knocks the truck up off the ground. Makes me airborne. Well, the other guy was drinking, and he did not even see what happened. He just, instead of swerving, of course, he was going awfully fast. We hit almost head on. And I shoved the steering wheel of that Jeep through the windshield. My foot was on the brake, and I broke the brake pedal off. My knees just moved the, the deal. And I was going back faster backwards than I was going forward. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I talk about a scary situation here. God had something for me to do. When I got out, I looked at the front of that Jeep, and it was not there. It was gone. There wasn't any front on the Jeep. Those things are really strong, you know. They're made out of steel and iron. And it was gone. It knocked the whole bed loose on the back of it. Just pick up. The bed was just barely hanging there. The front end was over here and the tires were over there and the engine was laying over there on the ground. It even knocked the, the ring gear off the flywheel. Just tremendous shock. 
and I stepped out of there. The man that was driving the other one was dead immediately. That's one time when God snatched me out of God's time when he snatched me out of harm's way. Out of harm's way. Deliverance. Well, God not only gives us physical deliverance, he gives us social deliverance. Social deliverance. How does he deliver socially? Do you know, and Roger got my sermon for tonight, and he preached it Sunday morning. Most of the time he does it after, right at the same time I'm doing it, or, or whatever. But I was studying this last week, wasn't I? <laughs> Maryland. When we're born into this world, we're not responsible for we're black, we're white, we're red, we're yellow, or whatever we are. We, it's brown, whatever. We are not responsible for that whatsoever. Did you know that? But when God saves somebody, you're all saved the same. You're on level ground. We are saved now. We are saved Indians, saved Mexicans, saved Orientals. We're saved black people. We're saved white people. We're all saved the same way. And we're all brothers and sisters because we are all from the human race. God levels the ground socially social deliverance. He gives us moral deliverance. He delivers us morally. Now this is deliverance right now. We're not talking about just the rapture that's going to happen. What is God, how is he delivering you now? The one snatching us away. Look over here. Present participle and his middle voice. Jesus is doing that. Did he snatch you out of some terrible tr crash today or something? How many of you almost get almost get killed on the road now and then. My neighbor. I was going down Taft Highway and I look over there and here's my neighbor's car and it's completely smashed to pieces. And she's got two little kids that Dakota's gone through school with for five years. I said, oh no. That's Gozer's car. And I was really worried. I went and picked up the coat and I said, uh, how about Rose's car? You know, was that Rose's car? Everybody said, yeah, Rose's car. Well, how is you? How's the kids? Whatever. What's going on here? Nobody knows. Next day, I walked into school and there's little Stephen sitting over there. He's alive. No bandages, no and nothing on him at all. And I said, Stephen, that, was that your car? And he said, yeah, that was my mom, but she was alone. And she's okay. Oh, she's okay. Snatched out of the jaws of death so many times. I remember when I went over to the Middle East. I was in a constant state of physical deliverance. <laughs> I remember when Travis Hubbard went over to the Middle East. He was praying, God, if you just get me home, I'll never leave my doorstep again. <laughs> I'll never get in another airplane. Oh, please let me get home. If you'll ever let me get home, if I ever get home, I'll be, I'll stay there. I won't ever do this again. All they were shooting bullets at me, trying to blow the airplane out of the sky. But we have physical deliverance, we have redemptive deliverance, we have social deliverance, and we have moral deliverance. You don't have to act like the world do. Does God give you the power over sin morally? Yeah, we do. Sometimes we put our places, ourselves in places where we shouldn't be, don't we? Some of us are, we walk for angels' fear to pray. Don't we? Sometimes we put ourselves in places where God has to snatch us out of there. Moral deliverance. How about spiritual deliverance? Ephesians, the sixth chapter. What does that say? We wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but against gigantic, powerful, supernatural, superhuman, way above human powers, super spiritual, it says world grabbers. That's what it says, world grabbers. 
You know, it's a lot better being in this room even if it's cold. Huh? The other one, you're suffocating. <laughs> yeah, they got her doing it all real good. <laughs> we are delivered out of the power of the evil one. He snatches us out of the hands of Satan. Out of the moral decay of the world today. He snatches us out of that devil. We don't have to live in that. We don't have to look at it. We don't have to smell of it. We don't have to rub elbows with it. Because God gives you the power to get out of it. Jude says, and Peter both talks about snatching those, and even Enoch. He talks about that we should snatch our loved ones out of the fire. This fire is the moral decay of the world. This is sin is the power of immorality. Did you know that? Sin is what keeps people from being saved. It's what keeping sometimes it what it's what keeps God's people from serving his him. This is quite a worse verse, isn't it? The wrath, tase et culminates. Wrath of the one coming. Now it's, what is it here? It's oblative, out of the wrath, out away from the wrath, oblative, singular, feminine. It's talking about the orgase there. And it's this coming, this wrath that is coming, present participle, and what kind of, that's middle voice. Like a time bomb, isn't it? It's got its own detonator. Sin, God is going to judge. God's people ought to make a difference in this world. When you go out in the world, God, ought, people ought to be able to see you and say, this is God's person, this is God's man, this is God's woman. There are so many places that we go in this world that we are not the kind of witnesses that we ought to be. If you don't open your mouth you ought to be a witness. You know that. Because of what you are and who you are. You ought to be a witness. You ought to pray when you eat. If you pray when you eat, I, I remember so many times I've been out praying in public. And several times people have walked up to us and say, It is refreshing to see somebody pray. God bless you. Tell us. That's what they'll say sometimes. It's refreshing to see somebody pray. Revelation, the sixth chapter, verses 16 and 17. Revelation, six, verses 16 and 17. I'll have to turn you loose here in a minute. I need a clock in this room. <laughs> Boy, we're right up with time. Technology. Revelation, 16. No, Revelation 6, 16 and 17. I've scribbled over my writing so much I can hardly read it. Who's got that? Six, sixteen, seventeen. You have that, brother? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> brother Greg, have you got 11? <clears throat> Re look up Revelation 11. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? All right. Here we have people. These are sinners. These are lost people. Instead of bowing down and calling upon the Lord to save them, they're trying to hide from God. How many times do people that you witness are trying to hide from God? You need to be saved today. And they say, oh, not today, tomorrow. It's going to be all right. When I get there, God will just overlook it. I'm special, you know. God's going to overlook my sin, my life. No, He's not. And if they make it into the into the tribulation period, they're going to ask the mountains to fall off and hide. Okay, Revelation 11 and verse 18, Brother Gray, and then 16 and 19, and 19 and 15. Verse 18. And the heathen rage, but your wrath came the time when the dead will be judged. 
and your servants, your prophets, and saints rewarded, and those who revere your name both low and high, and small and great, and for destroying the, the corrupters of the earth. That must be the Amplified Bible. It is. Yeah, that's, I that's that's the that explains. That's beautiful. <coughs> yes. Only 11, Re nine. Revelation 11 and 18. And then Revelation 16 and 19, and 19 and 15. Revelation 16 and 19. Who's got that? Ken, you got that one? And then, Greg, you look up 19 and 15. And the great city was split into three parts, and the city, and the cities of the nations fell. And Babylon the great was, re, was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. All right. And the 19 and 15. The wrath of God. Yes, brother. From his mouth goes forth the sharp sword with which he can smite the nations, and he will shepherd and control them with a staff of iron. He, he will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and indignation of God, the all ruler, the mighty and the omnipotent. All right. God Almighty is going to bring judgment on this earth. I remember when I was a little kid, my grandma would tell me that in the Battle of Armageddon, that blood was going to run as deep as the horse's bits. That's something they, they, I mean, they've been talking about that for the last 2,000 years. You know that? Mm -hmm. People have been talking about that for the last 2,000 years. 1,900 and something anyway, might near 2,000. How high is a horse's bit? Well, when he's grazing on the ground, it's not very high, is it? But when he's carrying himself, how high is it? Up this tall. About that tall. Blood's going to run that deep in that valley. Blood. Wrath. People are going to be chopped to pieces. Uh, it, the, the mountain Megiddo and the valley of Megiddo, where this is, the Megiddo and Armageddon, you know what they mean? Armageddon? The mountain of chopping to pieces. The mountain of cutting to pieces. <coughs> Blood's going to run. We got previews of coming tractors over there in the Middle East right now. That war is not going to be over. We're not fighting a war of just of just see who's stronger. We're fighting a religious war over there in the Middle East that's going to go on and on and on. There's going to be a period of time, that, and this is in the right place, too, people. There is nothing we can do about it. Pray for the for the the, the children and the men mothers and fathers that are over there dying right now because the dying is going to quit. Not unless we pull out of there. We're not going to win it because we can't win it. Why can't we win it? It's not going to quit. It's not ever going to quit. We have walked them to a place where there is hate and there is fear and the only way that they know to make you afraid of them is to do just terrible terror acts. And they've been doing this for thousands of years. It's not something that happened 30 or 40 years ago. I was over there in 1975 and 76, and I saw it coming then. And it's going to culminate in what we talked about just there from those scriptures. People being cut to pieces. There's been a lot of blood shed over there and splattered all over those places. It's, it's, it's a religious war today. It's a religious war. It's a war that they will die for. Yeah, the more, the more they kill, the more victory. Is yeah, and uh, no matter what happens to them, the more we persecute them and, and drive them back, it's martyrdom. It fuels. And you have to track this. This is not the same, but you have to realize back during the Dark Ages, when were the Baptist churches the strongest? And this is a human psyche that we're talking about. When were the Baptist churches the strongest in the Dark Ages? Right after Persecution. When the heaviest persecution, when their blood was being shed, it fueled the fires of truth. Uh, that's not truth over there, but I'm going to tell you, martyrdom fuels fires. They really fight harder. They'll fight harder and more viciously than ever before. I'm not taking up for them by any means. It's all evil. 
every country, the rulers and the powers to be are set on fire by the flames of hell itself. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers. This country has spiritual forces behind it. And people are making decisions, and their way is plowed, is made straight for those sources, for those forces to get into action. And all of it is leading up to one thing, to the end times, eschatology. These books that I've studied here, the book of Revelation, the book of Jude, 1 and 2 Peter, and now 1 and 2 Thessalonians are all eschatology. These are all studies of the end times. And we are living in the end times. According to everything that every theologian has ever studied for the last 2,000 years in the church age, it says that there's going to be a time when this takes place. And they've been talking about it forever. Except, right now, 200 years ago, 75 years ago, people couldn't have taken the mark of the beast and people couldn't have been controlled like they are supposed to be controlled in the book of Revelation. Where you buy and sell with a number. People thought that Babylon and Persia would never, ever exist again. And surely, when it talks about fighting over there in Babylon and, and all of these great Oriental cities that are over there, these these eastern cities with these where the Arabs live, they have to spiritualize that and make that something else. Well, guess what? Zip. We're here. Those powers are there. The very forces that, that the Bible says in the book of Revelation, the book of Ezekiel, and Daniel, and first and second Thessalonians, and the book of Jude, and Isaiah, and of course Revelation. All of these books that tell us what's going to happen, the very players in those last things are all in the scene today. They're there. But we have hope. The world has no hope. I'm going to tell you, the world has no hope. If you're lost and your children, your family are over there, what kind of deliverance do we have? We have redemptive deliverance. We have physical deliverance. We have social deliverance. We have moral deliverance. We have spiritual deliverance. We have all of these deliverances. Now, not tomorrow. When the Lord raptures us out of the way, we have complete deliverance. But today, a gun can blow up in your hand and you can live. I'm living evidence of that. You can have a car wreck and you can come out of it. You can go over there in the Middle East where bullets are flying. I did it. Well, it can't be. I don't know how bad it was when you were over there, Mother. But, boy, I mean, the bullets were flying when I was there in 75 and 76. It was miserable. And I said, how long are you live like this? I said, you drive on the freeway. <laughs> well, I was angry. I said, yeah, I did. Said, well, it's a lot more. You're a lot more likely to get killed on the L.A. freeway than you over here getting shot by a bullet. Well, that's true. But how many of you have survived the L.A. freeway? <laughs> so far now one of these days you might not do it but you know something God grants us the hope and deliverance right now of so many things I hope you enjoyed your lesson tonight from God's word there's a whole lot more yet we could go on and on do you see what I was talking about the little people and you look in the little tiny peephole, and you look in there, and you see a great big spectrum of everything in every direction. We look at some of that. Do you see it dimly at least? At least. Dimly. You'll have the to book. bring your gun next week, Jerry. Yeah. At least we'll I'll, I'll have to bring it. <laughs> you know, I just got it for my son so I could bring it. Right here for this verse. And I walked off and forgot it. Please pray for me, because I haven't felt very well at all. When did pray that for my sister. Yes. When did that happen? When did that happen? That's a long time ago. That's a long time ago. In the 60s. That's the dark age. Probably about 1965, 66, 67, 68. Between 65 and 70, somewhere. 
Yeah, we're back that yeah, far. I remember the 60s. It's a wonder you're here, Jim. <laughs> what? It's a wonder you're even alive. It's a wonder I'm here. But it's by the power of God. It's not by accident. Oh, God had me something to do. That's right. And just like today, all you know what? I'm, I'm going to share this with you. The last year and a half, I've been really sick. You know that. You prayed for me. You seen me go through radiation and chemotherapy, and, and they gutted me and put me back together and everything else. Well, it's miserable. But this has been spiritually the best year of my life. And God has blessed me greater this year than I believe he ever has in my life. The work that I've done has been recognized by so many people, being used by so many people all over the world. I mean, all over the world. We've got letters from people every day that tell us that they want to take these classes that you're a part of and put them all over India, New Zealand, Australia, Africa, or someplace. All the time. And right now, there's about 130 people listening to tapes a day on Discover the Word of God. Well, and then the people in our class, I, I want to get 50 people in here in the next couple of weeks. In the you know, Sunday morning. We're going to wrangle you in here. Tie you up. Lasso you. Bring you in here. I want to see this classroom filled up. I'm going to see people's lives saved and deliverance from sin and deliverance from hell. I want to see this. And you are going to take part. Yes. Um, are these different people from the ones you did last week? Because you said the same thing last week. The different people, which different people? He said the same thing last week. I'm getting 50 people. Yes. <laughs> we had a lot of sick people Sunday morning. And uh, we want to get... We want to get. I want to see a whole lot of here on Wednesday night too. Bring your friends. Get them introduced to the Word of God. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. And Brother Greg, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, brother? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship we have with one another.